I'm Mo Markham, and uh, we are Liberation Hour Radio, and today we are interviewing Tony Weiss. Uh, Liberation Hour Radio um, is uh, 102.7 FM, Radio Waterloo, uh, Rogers 946 in London, and uh, we're also on Facebook and YouTube. Thanks for having me. It's a great, great to be here. Tony is an associate professor of geography at Western University. Uh, he did his uh, master's in environmental studies, his PhD in geography. Uh, he is the author of the ecological hoofprint of the global burden of industrial livestock and the global food economy, the battle for the future of farming. He's also written numerous articles, book chapters, and he has co-edited a couple of books. His research is in the field of political ecology and with a focus on agriculture and food systems. Welcome, Tony, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, I understand over the past decade, your work has been centered mainly on the increase in industrial livestock and um, the production and consumption of mass and the massive implications for the environment. Uh, for food security and for interspecies relations. Um, and just looking at the urgent need um, to confront all of these issues. So I'm going to ask you a little bit about that, um, but also just ask you about uh, your, your life. You're, you are a professor at, um, at Western, I understand. Um, you have kids and, and companion animals as well. Um, what animals do you have in your life right now, Tony? Uh, I have two cats, uh, a mother and her son, and uh, recently adopted puppy uh, about three weeks ago. He entered our lives and uh, loads of fun and, and also loads of work. Loads of chaos, I'm sure, too. Yeah, yeah. And I shouldn't say work is not the right word for it. It's, it's mostly fun, but uh, it does take a lot of time. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And the cats are adjusting to him. Uh, they... He seems to want to interact with them more than they want to interact with him. <laughs> yeah, I've no doubt. They're not so sure, right? No. Um, I really love the name of uh, your book, uh, The Ecological Hoofprint. Um, and though, as you say in the book, uh, it kind of leaves out the uh, our feathered friends. Um, but can you tell us a bit why you chose that name for the book? Yeah, it's, it's a concept I... I first introduced in the global food economy, my first book, and, um, and, and sort of laid out some of the contours of that idea. Basically, it was a, a play on the ecological footprint, which is a very well-established concept. Uh, I think it's well-established both in an academic sense, but also in a popular consciousness. Um, the ecological footprint was introduced um, in the late 80s, early 90s by uh, Canadian environmental scientist William Reese and, and Mathis Wackernagel, and it's had a lot of traction, I think, drawing attention to the resource budgets and pollution loads that are embedded in daily life. And, and so a lot of people, um, I mean, there's footprint, there's multiple footprint calculators you can find out there. The, the UN has referred to footprint uh, analysis at, at multiple points. So there's I think a great value in the, the footprint as a concept, thinking about the environmental implications of everyday life. And it's also been translated in, um, uh, in subsequent years to things like the climate footprint, uh, water footprinting. Um, and so ba basically analyses of environmental, uh, of environmental implications of, of resource consumption. And one of the things that I think it's, it, it really significantly did uh, with respect to environmental uh, politics and, and activism is, is really centered in equality in environmental problems. So, um, you know, not just talking about human population in a general sense or, or the human species as um, uh, this, this sort of unified whole, but really stressing that um, there are tremendous disparities in, in resource consumption and, and with it, uh, people command hugely differential shares of, of the Earth's uh, land space or atmosphere. Um, and so the ecological footprint is, is sort of part of the path or part of the intellectual uh, foundation of the, the ecological uh, hoofprint. Now, a bit, which basically was trying to stress the resource budgets and pollution loads associated with 
uh, industrial livestock production, which command a huge share of the, the world's arable land. Now, as you mentioned, and, and the point that I raise in the book, the, the hoofprint analogy where it fails is, is the fact that uh, poultry is, is a large and, and in fact, the largest growing segment of industrial livestock production. Um, it's right now roughly equal with, with pigs. The, so pigs and poultry are the two, by far the two biggest sources of, of meat production on a planetary scale and poultry is growing the fastest. But it's still a beautiful title. <laughs> for sure. And, and um, uh, I want you to talk a little bit about um, your, the concept of the meatification of the planet, but um, you, you're talking about poultry, ab about chickens and, and um, other birds that we eat. I wonder if you can um, expand on that a little bit. You know, people think that they're doing uh, a good thing for the planet by eating chicken. Can you... Um, talk about that a little bit um, and, and about meatification, I guess, generally, yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll start with the poultry. Um, when, when we talk about poultry, of course, there's other birds, turkeys, uh, ducks, yeah. uh, but poultry overwhelmingly by volume is, is chickens uh, on a planetary scale. Oh, well, over 95% of, of poultry by volume is, is chickens. One of the ways that that shift has been championed, I guess, by, by poultry producers is by saying that it's more environmentally friendly or more efficient than uh, pigs or especially than uh, beef. And one of the things I stress is that um, it's not that it's more efficient, it's less inefficient. There are still huge losses of of usable nutrition and cycling feed through, through um, chickens and other poultry birds to, to produce their flesh or, or to produce eggs. So it's, um, yes, there is less feed that goes into uh, a given unit of food outputs in terms of animal flesh or eggs um, relative to other livestock animals, um, but it's, it's, the, 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 it's, it's a real de deceptive claim to say that it is um, better for the environment. I, I like to say it's less worse than maybe pigs, but then what that translates to also is, is a lot more individual lives packed in immense densities and uh, live most in industrial settings, very miserable lives, and, and there's a much greater um, number of those lives. So. Um, you know, w when we cycle our food through animals, um, we, we waste massive amounts of nutrition. And, and I, I have to say that, that one of the things that I find very frequently is people don't think about, because we aren't taught to think about and we don't see it, you know, we, we don't live on farms, we don't see that animals eat food and drink water and use resources, etc. Um, so that's something that people don't think about. I wonder if you could talk about um, that a little bit, uh, you know, all of that, that waste uh, that's involved there. Yeah, one of, one of the first people to draw attention to that was Francis Moore Lappe uh, in a book called Diet for a Small Planet in the early 70s when the trajectory of feed crops, uh, using feed crops to raise uh, intensively confined animals was really growing in the 50s and 60s. And she uh, drew attention to how um, much land area is, is being devoted to feed crops. At that time, it was principally grains, uh, things like corn. And over time, it's become not just corn and other coarse grains, but also soybeans uh, as, as a huge um, uh, source of growth in, in terms of global land use in the past four decades or so. Uh, and so she really stressed how the when you cycle crops, again, at the time she was first writing, mostly grains, now grains and oil seeds, especially soybeans, and in, in some places canola also. When you cycle these crops through concentrated populations of animals, um, you don't get the same food outputs uh, out that in terms of the volume of feed that went in. So there's a loss of usable nutrition there. And so she stressed in Diet for a Small Planet that for most of the history, 10,000 year history of agriculture, animals were what she called protein factories. Uh, and the, the, the term protein factories, she says that, you know, they were generating usable sources of protein in their flesh, but also in many cases, their milk and eggs were more important than their flesh as a source of protein. They were generating these through complementary land uses. So they were 
feeding on crop stubble, they were feeding on household food wastes, they, for in the case of poultry birds, you know, picking around um, farm households for seeds and insects. Uh, they weren't actually drawing on much, if any, arable land. Um, and this is something that really dramatically changed in the, in the 20th century, especially the mid 20th century onwards, that the soaring uh, increase in using arable land to feed concentrated populations of animals. And so Francis Moore Lappe um, said, you know, there's this shift to, from animals being protein factories um, where they generated usable sources of nutrition from complementary land uses to uh, what she called reverse protein factories where they're basically losing a lot of the the, nutri the nutrition, protein included, but also other sources of nutrition in the grains. And, and as I stress also over time, the, the oil seeds, um, there a lot of that nutritional value of the feed is basically wasted in animals' metabolism before it ends up as, as the food that people consume in animals' flesh or, or also milk and eggs. So can you give us an estimate as to like how much, uh, how much food is wasted? Um, that way, can you, do you have a? Um, that, I mean, it varies greatly from species to species. So one of the things she identified going way back to the 70s, and, and it's, this is still holds, is that poultry tends to be more efficient at converting feed to flesh uh, or to egg outputs than pigs, and pigs tend to be more efficient than uh, beef. As I stressed, it's, uh, I don't like the idea of more efficient. I think it's better understood as being less inefficient because there still is a lot of metabolic wastage there, but it, it really d depends on uh, species to species and it, it also depends on a, a range of other factors. So uh, one of the big things I think to keep in mind here is that uh, concentrated animals now command about a th close to a third of the world's arable land. So, uh, and, and a lot of the best arable land. So um, huge areas of land devoted to uh, coarse grains, especially corn and oil seeds, especially soybeans that are uh, overwhelmingly flowing through animals. And again, a lot of the nutritional value in that food is wasted that could, so that land use could be much more efficient um, if it were being consumed directly by humans rather than cycling through animals to uh, produce flesh, milk, and eggs. Um, we talked about, I think you, you mentioned actually um, monoculture, uh, uh, monocultures like monocrops. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? I, I've, I hear, see so many times online that people blame, you know, uh, the uh, soy and, and that sort of thing on, on vegans um, that, that, uh, that we're, you know, eating soy and we're killing the planet with eating soy. Can you talk about that a bit? Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a common uh, critique of, of veganism is, is the, the problems of industrial soy. And there are very real problems. Industrial soybeans uh, are uh, implicated in, in a lot of environmental problems, uh, fertilizer intensity, machine, uh, intensive, um, a lot of soy is genetically modified, uh, pesticides. So there's, there is a big environmental uh, footprint to industrial soybeans, but most industrial soybeans are not being consumed by vegans. Most industrial soybeans are being consumed by um, meat eaters and they're through the, the flesh that uh, they're consuming. So most soybeans, um, anyone who, who basically blames the problems of industrial soy on, on vegans is it, it's, it's uh, a, a really uh, confused target because most industrial soy is tied to industrial livestock. Um, so it's being eaten by the animals um, in, animal, in, in the animal agriculture industry as opposed to um, most of it's not being eaten by uh, humans directly, it's being eaten by animals. Yeah, absolutely. A, a very small share of world soy is going into tofu and soy, soy milk and, and those sorts of things. A much bigger share is going into livestock. Now, some soy, a lot of soy is, is pressed and the oil is used for various things, but in terms of the, so, the material, the, the soy meal, the vast majority of that on, on a planetary scale is, is, is going to livestock. Okay, um, and we, we 
we started talking about it before, but we uh, I just wanted to come back to the term meatification of the planet. Can you um, talk about that again? Okay, I think one of the, the, the best ways to encapsulate that term meatification of, of diets is, is to stress that in um, basically about two generations, the average human being has roughly doubled their uh, livestock consumption uh, or their consumption of animal, uh, animal flesh. Um, so the, and, and roughly doubling of egg, per capita egg consumption as well. So in 1960, there was about 3 billion people on earth and the average person on earth consumed about 23 kilograms of meat per year. Today, there is, um, we're closing in on 8 billion people on earth and there, the average person on earth now consumes about 45 kilograms of meat per year. So that's a near doubling in, uh, as I indicated, roughly two generations or so, um, about 60 years. And so there, there's this, and, and that at a time of phenomenal human population growth. So, and that growth is expected to continue. The FAO projects that by 2050, the average human will be consuming uh, over 50 kilograms of meat per year uh, in a world of probably close to 10 billion people. And so, so as, as our population is growing, our meat consumption is growing as well, and at a time when it's abs an absolute disaster for the planet as well. Yeah, and, and one of the things that I've, uh, is really important to stress here is that it's not just, um, I mean, th those are global figures I was indicating. Uh, there's huge disparities on, on a world scale. So the average American consumes about 120 kilograms of meat per year. Uh, the average person in uh, South Asia consumes under 10 kilograms of meat. Wow, that's a huge difference. Yeah, and the average person in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa under 20 kilograms of meat. So there's per year. So there's huge disparities. Canada, of course, at the uh, higher end of that spectrum, around 100 kilograms of meat per year. So wow. that, so that 10 that, times, more than 10 times uh, the, the number of uh, the, the amount of, of uh, meat that people are eating in, in other countries. Um, well, in, in many poor countries, yeah. But yeah. The, the other, so that's one really important point to stress is these huge global disparities between rich and, and low income countries. Another important point to stress is that the growth is happening fastest right now in the middle. So rich countries are have largely saturated the, the level of uh, animal flesh they can consume, so it's not really rising in any wealthy country, uh, but in a lot of fast-growing countries or middle-income countries like China, Brazil, that's where the, the growth has been fastest um, for the past few decades and is where it's projected to be fastest moving forwards, and also in amongst um, upper and middle classes in, in low-income countries. So, um, so some countries, the Asian countries, etc., are moving more towards a Western diet, um, and uh, that that means an increase in in um, animals animal products and animals uh, being eaten. Yeah, uh, for many years that had been an explicit state policy in China is to consume animal flesh on a on a level comparable to uh, industrial industrialized countries. So China, the the state had been very actively promoting uh, the industrialization really? of livestock. Yeah, nineteen. 80, so not that long ago, just 40 years ago, 1980, China was way below the world average in terms of per capita animal uh, consumption per year, and now it's way above. Um, interestingly, in the, in the past few years, China, the, chi the Chinese state has recognized that this is a real problem, uh, rising levels of obesity and other non-communicable diseases in China, and also the environmental implications of this uh, China is home to about half the world's pigs. So China has a bit, a bit under one fifth of humanity and roughly half the world's pigs live in China. And one of the, the ways those pigs are fed is by huge soybean imports. So there are um, enormous flows of soybeans moving across the Pacific uh, from the United States and also um, from the, the southern cone of South America, so countries like Argentina and, and the southern part of Brazil, that produce huge volumes of soybeans. A lot of that soybean export is going to China to feed its its growing livestock sector. Right. So, um, can you 
Can you talk a little bit too about, uh, I was going to get to this later, but since we're already talking about uh, China and other countries moving towards a Western diet, can you talk about the health uh, implications of that as well? Yeah, so I, I think there's overwhelming evidence now that the, uh, this, the trajectory of, of uh, meatification is implicated in a whole range of, of um, increased disease risk. Uh, so non what often referred to as the NCDs, non-communicable diseases, uh, heart, um, heart and cardiovascular disease, obesity, type 2 diabetes, um, a range of cancers. The, the, there's very strong evidence that um, the tra trajectory of dietary change that I've been talking about is, is a major part of that. It's not the only factor in that, but it's a major part of that story uh, and that uh, there's also overwhelming evidence that um, reversing the course of meatification can lead to beneficial health outcomes as, as well as, of course, beneficial environmental outcomes. Right, for sure. Um, I would like to uh, get into uh, the environmental uh, impact some more, but I'm thinking maybe we should just take a quick break right here um, and uh, we will come back in a few minutes. Um, I'm Mo Markham uh, interviewing Tony Weiss on... Um, uh, Liberation Hour Radio. We will be back. We often hear in the news about global warming, sea level rise, methane emissions, and more. But what exactly can be done to stop the climate crisis? First off, we need to know, what exactly is causing the climate crisis? Global warming is caused by a buildup of three primary greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, which trap heat just like the glass of a greenhouse. To give you some more technical details, carbon dioxide is a chemical compound composed of one carbon and two oxygen atoms, CO2. Methane is composed of one carbon and four hydrogen atoms, CH4. And nitrous oxide is comprised of two nitrogen and one oxygen atoms, N2O. The carbon cycle exists to exchange carbon among the biosphere, soil, oceans, and the atmosphere of the Earth. Each time that a living being breathes, they release carbon dioxide gas into the atmosphere. Forests then absorb that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere through photosynthesis. Forested areas of the Earth act as a sink, draining heat-trapping carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. To give you an example, the Amazon rainforest has estimated 390 billion trees and absorbs 2 billion tons of CO2 every year, making it a vital part of preventing climate change. Oceans also absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere wherever air meets water. As atmospheric carbon dioxide levels go up, the ocean absorbs more carbon dioxide to stay in balance. However, this absorption leads to ocean acidification, which threatens marine organisms such as coral and plankton. So, what are the main human contributors to greenhouse gas emissions? Humans are generating greenhouse gases from two primary sources, burning fossil fuels and raising animals for slaughter. The burning of fossil fuels emits vast amounts of carbon dioxide. Every time that a plane takes off, the heating is turned on in your home, or a car speeds down the motorway, carbon dioxide is being released as a result. Another major source of greenhouse gases is the destruction of carbon sinks. Trees absorb CO2 and create areas where carbon literally sinks from the atmosphere. However, clear-cutting forests and burning trees release carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere and adds to global warming. It is important to note that eating animals is the largest contributor to land clearing, habitat destruction, and deforestation, and also the destruction of carbon sinks. In fact, data from the World Bank states that animal agriculture is responsible for the 91% of Amazon rainforest destruction. When it comes to methane, you may have heard of a process called fracking. Fracking is where drills dig down into the Earth's crust and inject water, sand, and chemicals into the rock at high pressure forcing gas to flow out to the head of the well. Fracking can kill birds and other wildlife through noise pollution, the release of wastewater, and also water withdrawal from local rivers. However, while fracking is a huge issue when it comes to the fight against climate change, in the United States, for example, methane emissions from animals used for meat and natural gas are nearly equal. Methane is produced by an animal's digestive process in which microbes decompose and ferment in the digestive tract. This gas is then emitted when animals, well, belch. 
Beyond that, animals used for meat are responsible for 65% of all human-related emissions of nitrous oxide, a greenhouse gas with 296 times the global warming potential of carbon dioxide, and nitrous oxide can also stay in the atmosphere for 150 years. So now that we know about the causes of the climate crisis, what can we do to stop it? Joseph Poor, a researcher at the University of Oxford who led much of the research on animal agriculture's emission states, a vegan diet is probably the single best way to reduce your impact on planet Earth, not just greenhouse gases, but global acidification, eutrophication, land use, and water use. Ending animal agriculture would allow us to tackle the methane crisis. If we compare methane to CO2, it is a stronger greenhouse gas and it has a much higher heat trapping ability. While it's known that methane stays in the atmosphere for less time than carbon dioxide, a molecule of methane has been found to have 25 times the global warming potential of a molecule of carbon dioxide, which makes it a huge priority in protecting the future of life on planet Earth. Adopting a vegan or plant-based diet would also reduce global farm land use by more than 75%, equivalent to the land mass size of the United States, China, the EU, and Australia combined. Finally, it's imperative that we ban global deforestation being led by animal agriculture and run reforestation programs to plant trees and reforest the earth. For the planet, for the animals, for future generations. Adopt a plant-based diet and reforest the earth. Switch to plant-based. Hi there, I'm Mo Markham. Uh, we are on uh, 102.7 Liberation Radio um, in Waterloo, 946 uh, uh, Rogers Cable in London. And um, I am uh, and also Facebook and YouTube, and I'm here interviewing uh, Tony Wise from uh, the University of Western Ontario. Uh, and we just had a bit of a break, and I just want to come back and talk to Tony about some of the uh, environmental implications of animal agriculture and uh, I guess I, I know you've done some work overseas but you're also from southern Ontario uh, like I am. Uh, can you tell us a bit about what what the landscape looked like here before industrial agriculture, before uh, animal agriculture was introduced, what that, that looked like? Prior to the arrival of Europeans in this part of the world, and indeed across all of the Americas, there was very little animal agriculture. Uh, animal agriculture um, is something the Europeans brought with them wherever they went in the Americas and, and other parts of the world like Australia, New Zealand. Um, but in the Americas, the, the only livestock of any note were turkeys. Um, it's at really small densities and, and some other uh, parts of the Americas had a, had a few other animals. Uh, there was some indication of, of sophisticated aquaculture systems in places like Amazonia, uh, but no uh, large-scale livestock. And so in this part of the world, the indigenous peoples were um, farmers and, and, uh, um, and also gatherers and hunters. So the, the introduction of, of cattle horses, sheep, goats, chickens, pigs, that all came to the Americas with, with the um, onset of European colonialism. Great. So it looked pretty different. In, in terms of what animal agriculture is doing to diversity generally, um, and, and it's, uh, it's changed things here, uh, certainly. A um, uh, lot fewer trees than, than we would have had. Um, and, and just in general, uh, can you talk a little bit about um, what animal agriculture has done to uh, diversity on the planet in, in general, um, both uh, plant and, and animals, in terms of plants and animals? Well, animal agriculture is the biggest uh, human land use on, on the planet by far. So uh, livestock command about a th close to a third of the world's arable land. So arable land is the um, land that's devoted, best agricultural land is devoted to relatively permanent crops. And that's about somewhere between 10 and 12% of the earth's land surface is given to permanent crops. And about a third, close to a third of that is crops that are produced for animals. 
uh, but a bigger share, even bigger share of land is given to um, pasture of, of one sort or another. And that is close to um, a quarter of the Earth's land surface, somewhere between 22 and 25% of the Earth's land surface is in pasture. Uh, and that is mostly things like cattle and, and also to a lesser extent sheep and goats, uh, most primarily ruminants. So the, uh, again, livestock is this uh, gigantic, commands a gigantic share of the world's land, both in, in terms of crops and, and pasture. And in terms of crops, it is, um, again, drawing on uh, principally um, coarse grains and oil seeds, principally soybean monocultures. So it's implicated in, in you know, the loss of biodiversity in agriculture um, at, the, at the level of soils, at the level of crop diversity, and at the level of, of landscapes. And, and trees, um, uh, so so many trees, which which we could really use right now in terms of of mitigating uh, climate the climate disaster. Um, we're cutting down trees uh, for animals. I guess that takes me to another question that um, uh, around um, uh, you know so many people think that. Uh, uh, raising animals free range is going to solve our problems. We can, as long as we get rid of industrial agriculture, then then we're okay if we have all these animals that we're raising now free range. Can you speak to that a bit, Tony? Yeah, I mean, th there's a, a range of issues there. One is that, you know, the, the global ruminant population is an enormous source of methane. Uh, the leading source of global methane, in fact, is, is global ruminants, although, um, I mean, methane is, there's a methane bomb in the permafrost, but for now, the, the biggest source of methane is, is livestock. Um, and the, the livestock, um, you know, grazing on land that, as you mentioned, was some of it was once forest, some of it was once natural grassland, some of it was once, what, once wetlands. That's not inevitable, an inevitable land use. So the, the idea that uh, all the land that is currently devoted to pasture, again, close to a quarter of the Earth's land surface, that that is its, um, the idea that that is the inevitable use of that land, uh, I think is, is a really um, uh, problematic starting point. I think you know, the, the, the idea that livestock should be all free range um, pays very little attention to the uh, incredible loss of biodiversity. The UN just came out with a big report that uh, estimated close to a million species are likely to be lost in the coming century if the current trajectory was that, doesn't. Is that a, a million species? Yeah, close to a million species. I mean, the, the, you know, there's a range of different estimates of, of uh, threatened and endangered species, um, but uh, the, the story of, of extinctions and endangerment is, you know, very clear that we're now in the sixth extinction spasm in the history of life on Earth. And the idea of expanding livestock uh, just simply does not um, re respond to that, that crisis. We need to be shrinking the land given to agriculture and given to, to, to livestock animals and, and making more space for natural ecosystems, uh, both in the context of the climate crisis, but also in the context of the biodiversity crisis, making more space for uh, wild animals. So, so if, if animals are raised free range, they take more land, clearly, than, than, than um, um, factory farmed animals, which obviously I'm not promoting factory farming animals, um, but, but free range animals would mean uh, more grasslands, um, wetlands, um, uh, forests being destroyed. Is that, is that correct? Uh, I mean, in some cases, livestock, the expansion of, of um, pastured animals is, is implicated in an incredibly destructive ongoing uh, deforestation. And the Amazon basin is, is the greatest example of that. Um, cattle is a, is a major part of the, the story of Amazonian deforestation uh, in the past number of decades and in the present tense as well. Um, but I think it's important to remember not just the, the role of livestock animals in uh, present um, land use change like deforestation or desertification, but also in past um, 
land use change. So the, uh, as I was stressing that, you know, the fact that a quarter of the Earth's land surface is given to pasture, um, that not all of that land was home to great diversities of animals, but some of it was. And it's uh, the, the idea of expanding uh, pastured animals, free-range uh, free animals, um, the, the, that, that, that prospect just simply doesn't reconcile with uh, any sort of response to the, to the contemporary biodiversity crisis, which demands taking land out of pasture and agriculture and, and urgently trying to restore uh, self-organizing ecosystems on a massive scale. More free range would mean taking more of that land, is that correct? A lot of the uh, pastured animals are um, ruminants, which have a huge methane footprint, uh, again, led by cattle, but also sheep and goats, very significant on a world scale. So let's take a quick break and we'll come back and we'll talk some more about the environmental implications of, of uh, animal agriculture. Thanks so much, Tony, and uh, we will be back. there. I'm Mo Markham. Uh, we are on uh, 102.7 Liberation Radio um, in Waterloo, 946 uh, uh, Rogers Cable in London. Can you tell me, what do you say to the, uh, the people who are um, Alan Savory enthusiasts um, who uh, say that we need more livestock and not less, and in particular in North America, the North American version, which is, um, well, the buffalo is gone now, so we need to replace uh, that. We need to replace them with cows. Um, what's your response to that? Uh? Okay, well, I'll start with the buffalo part of that. Buffaloes are not all gone. They're actually farmed uh, significantly now. Buffaloes um, were on the brink of extinction at the turn of the 20th century. There was less than a, around a thousand buffaloes left on earth from uh, when Europeans first came to the Americas, there were somewhere between 30 and 60 million uh, buffalo that ranged across the, the great grasslands of, of North America. And by 1900, uh, that had been driven to uh, around 1,000 or under 1,000. Uh, now there are about 400,000 buffalo that are farmed, actually, um, and about 20,000 or so that live in relatively wild conditions in national parks. And, um, and refuges, but much more buffalo. So the species saved from the brink of extinction and much more of them are now ranged than are living in the wild. So the buffalo are, are not actually gone, uh, but of course cattle vastly outnumber them on, our, on, our, um, on the former grasslands. Very few natural grasslands are actually left. So most grasslands have been you know, transformed into uh, pasture with, with introduced grasses or again, feed crops that are uh, that are um, fed to concentrated populations of animals. So the 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 idea that more land that that we should be devoting more land to free range animals and, and for savory that you know the focus is on ruminants um, and the you know his, his ideas that you know we should be having more. Um, natural grasslands and, and large room and it's feeding on them. I mean, one very obvious um, point that gets ignored in that is, is the enormous contribution of those animals to, to methane, the world's leading source of methane emissions. Um, so that's, I think, one thing that's just uh, utterly at odds with the, the uh, imperatives of, of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The, the savory vision of, of more pasture uh, ignores the fact that um, 
you know, pasture has already displaced, um, you know, tremendous amounts of forests and natural grasslands and wetlands, and the, the, the prospects of biodiversity really hinge on uh, ecological restoration on a massive scale. So we need to be taking land out of pasture, we need to be reducing the amount of land devoted to uh, agriculture and making more space um, available for other species and, and restoring forests, restoring natural grasslands, restoring wetlands and, and many ecological assessments are, argue that we need to be thinking about this in a, in a really grand vision. Of the, the case for ecological restoration uh, you'll see a range of estimates, but some are that we need as much as a half of the world that needs to be ecologically restored if there's any hope of responding to the biodiversity crisis or the sixth extinction spasm and, and the climate emergency. So scientists like E.O. Wilson are now talking about a half earth rewilded and a half earth rewilded um, means again taking huge areas of, of uh, pasture um, out of, of um, that land use and, and restoring them to forests and, and uh, natural grasslands. So the, the savory vision I think just simply cannot be reconciled with, with the climate emergency, with the biodiversity. The climate and the, the reality of our current situation. And if we're taking land out of agriculture, the most efficient way of doing that is, is to take take away the food that we're cycling through animals needlessly and eating that food directly because obviously we still need to to eat. Can you talk a bit about um, uh, food stability, um, the number of people who die of starvation every year, um, whether that's um, inevitable? There's somewhere between 800,000 and uh, a billion people uh, suffering from uh, chronic malnutrition probably will go up drastically this year in the co context of the COVID crisis. Um, many argue that that number is, is really understated and there's many more that are food insecure, many more that suffer from micronutrient deficiencies uh, in addition to uh, just being short of say caloric intake, but there, there are uh, some estimates that suggest um, malnutrition when we take into account micronutrient deficiencies is vastly higher than a billion people on earth. Um, so the, while there might not be that many people literally starving to death uh, on this planet, um, there are many people that whose lives are, are intensely compromised. On, on a world scale, is this inevitable? Uh, absolutely not. There's far more than enough food produced on an annual basis to feed the planet at a far bigger population than the present one. So the FAO has estimated that there's, you know, easily enough food produced on an annual basis to produce uh, a population much greater than, than the present one. And part of the reason for that is that a huge volume of the world's uh, arable land is devoted to the, this incredibly inefficient use of, of cycling through animals. So if, if we were to take the food that we have and feed it directly to human animals rather than cycling it through non-human animals, farmed animals, um, we, we wouldn't have an issue with, with hunger on the planet. Um, I know there's some um, issues with uh, um, uh, distribution as well, but so much of the food that we have we're wasting at this point, we're, we're throwing away. Um, by cycling it through the animals um, that we are currently feeding. Yeah, so, so I mean there's a whole other issue of food waste, of food that is produced that ends up getting thrown out and there's, there's uh, this is something that's got a lot of attention over the past I think five years or so, the, the scandal of food waste, that a huge amount of food that is uh, um, grown or, or purchased ends up in landfills. Um, so that is, is part of the story of, of why there's so much more food, uh, why, why there's enough food to feed so many more people than um, exist on this planet, and yet you have a world with, with so much chronic malnutrition. Um, but the livestock story is, is also very, very central. That uh, Right. Huge. So when people think about food waste, they don't think about the food that's being cycled through animals and that's Yeah, so the food waste is often discussed in terms of, you know, people, the 
some estimates are in, in rich countries like Canada or the US, about a third of all food that's purchased will end up in a landfill rather than consumed by people. Some of that, of course, is livestock products and um, flesh or milk or eggs or those things embedded in different industrial foods. So some of that is directly livestock, not all of it. Um, but then there is the inefficiency of cycling feed through animals. Uh, to produce food, and that is, again, close to a third of the world's arable land and a, and a very inefficient use of that arable land. So um, I think, you know, there's just overwhelming evidence that plant-based diets command less uh, land area and less resources uh, per person than do um, diets that involve heavy uh, animal, pr uh, pr heavy levels of animal products. So, uh, and there's, the, the range of estimates you'll see on that, but there, there is you know, near uh, universal consensus that plant-based diets command less land per person. So then meat-based ones, and the implication of that is that we could be producing our food on a lot less land than we are. We could be taking land out of agriculture, we could be taking land out of pasture, we could be restoring it to forests and natural grasslands and wetlands, and we could be making space for other species. And at the same time, uh, as we're restoring ecosystems, we could be you know, helping to sequester carbon from the atmosphere and responding to the climate crisis. Right, because natural grasslands and trees would do that for us. Um, whereas right now, instead of doing that, we're using that land to farm animals that are producing greenhouse gas emissions rather than um, mitigating um, the, the problem that we have already. Yeah, and, and very importantly, also the soils too. So the soils in, in ecologically restored uh, systems uh, will be better uh, uh, reservoir, carbon reservoirs than our soils in industrial monocultures or, or um, extensive pasture. Right, so the soils will also absorb uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, if they are restored to their natural state, which currently um, is an issue that we need to address. Tony, um, where are you going from here? What, what are you working on uh, right now? Um, and you know, what's your hope uh, for what the future holds? Right now I'm in the midst of uh, trying to update, rework my first book on the global food economy. Uh, and also the, the bigger, um, longer running project has been a book called The Go Ghosts and Things. Um, the, the title ghosts implying the, the, the story of defaunation, so the decline of animal, wild animal populations on, on, a, on a global scale, and the things implying the increasing commodification of animals, the, the increasing uh, share of all animal life that is, is confined to industrial production, led by livestock, but other sectors as well. So I present these as, as two great trajectories of animal life on earth. One is the declining um, declining populations of, of wild animals. And this is, you know, the, the sixth extinction spasm. Uh, Can you give us a, a, a bit of a picture of, of um, where we are in terms of the, uh, the number of wild animals compared to uh, farmed animals and human animals? Can you give us a picture of that, uh, where we're at right now? In terms of it's hard to do in terms of individual animal lives because hugely different body sizes, but in terms of biomass, there have been a number of big assessments done and uh, the biomass of humans and livestock uh, are the vast majority of all mammalian life on earth. Um, the, the mammalian wild animals constitute a, a, a tiny uh, segment of all mammalian biomass. And a similar story is also true with birds, that uh, poultry birds, the biomass of poultry birds now um, is, is vastly greater than the biomass of all wild birds combined. Um, so this is part of, again, that, that dual trajectory that I'm uh, discussing and I call it, the, the talk about it in terms of the violent narrowing of life, um, biodiversity being massively lost, um, species, um, that are you know reduced to incredibly low precarious numbers right now in a desperate context of conservation in, in many uh, parts of the world uh, 
And at the same time, we have soaring populations of animals uh, produced in uh, industrial settings that command a huge share of the world's arable land that are contributing to the climate crisis. And the big goal of that uh, book is to talk about how those two stories are interwoven. The, the, the so the, the, animals, the animals in animal agriculture and the human animals are increasing in numbers and as the, uh, the number of wild animals and, and birds plummets um, as, as yeah. Uh, and we don't in that in that case again it's hard to give us get a sense of numbers because you know there's lots of small little mammals that are still uh, abounding uh, but in terms of large um, animals you know the populations have we know the populations of, of most wild animals uh, or large mammals have, have declined precipitously um, right. And so we've driven most of them to, to extinction, uh, or, many of them to extinction or just decrease their numbers massively. Yeah, so in some cases, and the story of defaunation is, is not just about endangerment and extinction risk, but talking about the huge population declines in non-threatened and endangered species. So um, the World Wide Fund for Nature, the WWF and the Zoological Society of London every year or every few years they put out a they call a living planet index and they've estimated that you know wild animal populations have fallen by roughly half on a planetary scale since 1970 you know, it's a, a very complicated estimate but you know the global surveys have have multiple surveys have, have painted a similar picture of these really uh, precipitous declines in wild animal populations the world over um, and at the same time, we have this soaring populations of animals confined to industrial production that also then command a, a very large share of, of the world's land. Um, to, in 19, I, I talked about the, the growth of, of meat consumption on a per capita level. If you think about that in terms of animal lives, um, in 1960, there was about 8 billion animals killed for food every year. Today, there's about 75 billion animals killed for food every year. Sorry, so in 1960, it was it was how many? It was how many million? Eight billion on a planetary scale. In today, Eight billion. Okay, and now 75 billion. Animals. 75 billion. Okay, and the so almost 10 times as many now. Yeah, and in terms of individual animal lives, the biggest driver of that is is chickens, uh, by far, and the by 2050, if meatification continues, if human beings are indeed consuming over 50 kilograms of meat per year uh, in a world of nine to 10 billion people by 2050, um, it's expected there will be 120 billion animals killed for food every year. That's not even counting fish. Um, right, right. Yeah. Fish, a whole lot of other story. So what what going forward what what do you want what what's your vision what do you want people to do what what do you think people governments what 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 do we need to do from here tony uh there's so so many changes it's hard to um have a manageable sound bite for that question uh i'm i mean for me the the biggest thing i try and do is is to make this trajectory of uh, of animal life on earth visible and, and to make people think critically about that. And I think when um, the, the more people are aware of it, uh, the, the, the destructive character of, of our agro food system, uh, the, the more there are efforts to, to try and rebuild alternatives. And I think there are all kinds of seams out there. Um, there there's all kinds of people fighting in different uh, important ways and in, in building alternatives at, at small scale. So I think there's all kinds of uh, glimmers of hope out there. But I, I think the big uh, dominant uh, system that we live in is, is, is immensely destructive and it's uh, there's all kinds of signs that it is it is cracking, um, and so I think there's a lot to be pessimistic about. Uh, um, and I try to take heart in in the the people out there who are are fighting the, the many good battles and, and working to build uh, alternatives at at a whole range of scales. Thank you, thank you so much for joining us today, Tony. Um, we really appreciate uh, your being with us. I'm Mo Markham, and I have been interviewing Tony Weiss from Western, the University of Western Ontario today. 
and about um, the ecological uh, hoof print and uh, what we're doing to the planet with animal agriculture. Um, we are uh, Liberation Hour Radio 102.7 uh, FM in Waterloo, and uh, we're also on Facebook and YouTube. Thank you so much for joining me, Tony. Appreciate your, your um, uh, being with us today. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Good night, folks. <laughs>